What is up, folks? So when you're learning data science and learning all the fundamentals, one of the really, really big ones, maybe even the most important one, is getting a strong grasp of linear algebra. And as you quickly learn when you take your first linear algebra course, matrices are at the heart, are the atoms of linear algebra. And you go through your course and you start learning about all these different types of matrices. It seems like there's a dozen or two dozen important types or special cases of matrices to be aware of. And at least for me, it got really confusing along the way because part of me was like, is this even useful? It's kind of cool for a matrix to have these properties or features, but is that something I'm gonna use as a data scientist? And so what I wanna do in this video, having worked in data science for several years now, is talk about what I consider the five most important types of matrices that you're going to learn in your linear algebra courses. And more importantly, talk about the intuition or what it means for a matrix to have each of these properties from a very intuitive problem solving point of view instead of a theoretical mathematical point of view. Now, this is probably gonna be the first video in a couple of other ones because I'm not gonna cover all of the important types of matrices. This is gonna be the most basic, very widely used types of matrices that I see all the time as a data scientist. And all five matrices we're gonna look at today share one property which is that they are all square matrices. There are definitely types of matrices in data science that are non-square, which are very important, but we'll save those for a future video. And that segues really well into what is the first very important type of matrix, which is exactly a square matrix itself. A square matrix, as the name very nicely suggests, is a matrix that has the same number of rows and the same number of columns. Now that's easy enough to understand, but what is the intuition? What does it tell you that a matrix has the same number of rows and columns. Well, one big clue you can learn from this, and this is not necessarily true, but in more cases than not, it will be true. It is that the rows and columns of a square matrix often represent the same, the same entities. Given there's an equal number of them, and it could, yes, be a coincidence, but mostly it's not a coincidence, it usually means that the rows are talking about the same entities, whatever that means in your problem, that could be students in a school or books in a library, whatever is the problem you're dealing with. The rows and the columns both talk about the same thing. And that means that any given number in this matrix, the ijth element of the matrix, tells you something about how the ith object that you're dealing with interacts or affects the jth object that you care about. So when you see a square matrix, your mind should immediately go to, hmm, it's probably square because the rows and columns are representing the same entities in my problem. So now, if I work under that assumption, can I read each of the numbers in this matrix as some kind of effect or force or quantity, which is linking the ith thing that's in my problem to the jth thing that's in my problem. For example, just to throw one real example here, the covariance matrix is exactly that. The rows and columns both represent the features in your machine learning problem, and each element in there tells you how much of a relationship there is between the ith feature and the jth feature. So that brings us to our next type of matrix, which is called a symmetric matrix. Now, we'll have a really nice diagram at the end which tells you how all these five types of matrices interact with each other and which imply other ones. But a symmetric matrix has a very simple definition. It says that the ijth element of this matrix, which we're calling A, is equal to the jth element of that matrix. So what that means, going back to this picture of the square matrix here, would be that if I look at some element here, just circling that, and I look at its mirror opposite. So for example, here, here I was going down by i and across by j. If instead I go down by j and across by i and go to that mirror element, basically, mirrored across the diagonal, those are gonna have the same exact value if the matrix is symmetric. But again, it's cool, but what does that tell us intuitively? If in the square matrix, we were looking at the ith entity we care about, having some relationship quantified by that element to the jth object we care about, if it's symmetric and we know those quantities are equal, no matter if we consider the ith element first or the jth element first, then it says those effects are equal or proportional or the same, no matter which order you consider those things in. And the covariance matrix here, again, comes in handy because it's not only square, it's also symmetric. If we look at what's the relationship between the ith feature in my data set and the jth feature in my data set, well, that's equal if we consider the problem the other way around. What's the relationship between the jth feature in my data set and the ith feature in my data set? 
And that's what it intuitively means for a matrix to be symmetric. Now one thing, which we'll again look at later, is that symmetric implies square. Because this definition kind of breaks down if we're looking at ij, and then if we swap those ji, but that element doesn't actually exist in our matrix because it's a rectangle either in the long way or the horizontal way. So a symmetric matrix is going to imply that it's square. Before moving on to our next type of matrix, I want to give kind of a subcase or a special case of symmetric matrices, which is called a skew symmetric matrix. A skew symmetric matrix has a definition which is almost the same as symmetric, but it has a negative sign out here. So this says that the ijth element of our matrix A is not equal to the jith element, but is equal to the negative of the jith element. So going to our picture here, that would say that if you have some number here and just pretend that's positive, then the number here would just be the negative of that. Or if this was negative to begin with, then that would be the positive version there. Why is this important? Well, it has pretty much the same intuition, but it just says that the effects are opposite and equal. So here the effects were exactly equal here. It's saying that, you know what, the magnitude of that effect doesn't matter which one you look at first or second, but the sign does. And so that can be the case too. But in the same case, symmetric and skew symmetric are both intuitively talking about the same thing. The magnitudes are equal of the effects between the ith and jth elements. So that brings us to triangular matrices. Triangular matrices come in two flavors, upper triangular matrices and lower triangular matrices. In a nutshell, a triangular matrix, again, going back to our picture here, is going to have zeros in one half of the matrix. So it's gonna have a lot of zeros down here. In fact, it's gonna be all zeros below the diagonal. And then the diagonal is not gonna be zero and everything above the diagonal is also allowed to not be zero. That is called an upper triangular matrix because the upper triangle of this matrix relative to the diagonal here is allowed to be non-zero elements, but everything below that triangle is exactly zero. A lower triangular matrix is exactly the opposite, so the diagonal and everything below the diagonal is allowed to not be zero, but everything above the diagonal does need to be equal to zero. And so that's exactly what these two definitions are saying. So here, aij is equal to zero for all i is less than j, or the other case, aij is equal to zero for all i is greater than j. So these are those two types of matrices, the upper or lower triangular matrix. Now what's the intuition here? If you're looking at a matrix and the upper or lower triangle are all zeros, what does that tell you intuitively? Well, I'm gonna give you an example here, just like we did with the covariance matrix to hopefully make it more clear. So for example, let's say you're doing a natural language processing problem, and you're trying to use the previous words in a sentence to predict what the next word in the sentence is going to be. And you're trying to do this to hopefully predict the next word that someone's gonna write in some kind of web document writing application. Now, Triangular matrices come in very handy here because when you think about a sentence that you might be using for training data, you're only allowed to use the words that already occurred in that sentence when predicting what the next word is going to be. It's not fair to use the future words in that sentence because they wouldn't have been written yet by the user when you actually release this application. And so, for example, in this case, predicting the next word can only use information about previous words is exactly a case where it can help to enforce that the training data you're using has this constraint of having a lower triangular form. For example, if I look at the first word, so that would be the first row here, then it's only allowed to use, well, no information because that's the first word being written. If I look at the second word, well, now it's allowed to use the information about the first word because that's already been written, but everything over here is gonna be equal to zero. If I look at the third word, it's allowed to use the information about the first and the second word, but everything after that needs to be zero because those words are off limits, not able to use them. And so same thing going down. If I'm looking at the very last, last word in my sentence, when I'm predicting that, I'm allowed to use the entire sentence because the entire thing has been written and it's fair game to use all of that training data. So you often see upper triangular or lower triangular matrices when you're dealing with problems where the order matters and you're only allowed to use things that came before or that are coming after, for example. And so that's kind of where my head goes when I think about triangular matrices. Now, going to four and five. So four are diagonal matrices. These are very, very easy to understand and explain. A diagonal matrix has ij element equal to zero anytime i is not equal to j. It's just a fancy way of saying that the diagonal, again, this needs to be a square matrix, the diagonal of a diagonal matrix is allowed to be non-zero elements, but if it's any element that's not on the diagonal, then it needs to be equal to zero. Only the diagonal is going to be populated. Now again, what's the intuition here? Because we're only allowing the diagonal 
to be non-zero elements. That means we only care, or we're only allowing, effects between some entity and itself. If we're asking questions about how does some entity I care about affect a different entity, we're enforcing that's equal to zero, self effects only. And number five, the last one we're gonna talk about is actually a special case of the diagonal matrix where we're enforcing yet another constraint where not only do all of the off diagonal elements need to be equal to zero, the on diagonal elements all have to be equal to one. So a small diagonal matrix, we can just draw a quick three by three one here, would have a one on the entire diagonal and it has to have zeros off of the diagonal. So this is a very restrictive matrix. Once you've told me how many rows it has, I can fill in the entire matrix just based off that piece of information. If you tell me it has 10 rows, well, I know this is a special case of the diagonal matrix, which is a special case of the square matrix. And so therefore it needs to have 10 rows and 10 columns. Everything off of the diagonal needs to be zero all the 10 elements on the diagonal need to be equal to one, and I fully filled in my identity matrix with size 10. Now what's the intuition here? So a matrix, which we learned very early on in linear algebra, is some kind of function that takes a vector and maps it to another vector. In this case, because in this entire video we're talking about matrices that are square, it takes a vector and maps it to a vector that's the exact same size. And here the identity matrix, if we multiply it on the right by any vector, it's gonna give us exactly the same vector back. So the identity matrix has a very unique property that whatever inputs you put into it, whatever inputs you put into it, are the same exact outputs that you get back. It seems a little bit pointless or useless as a function in that case, until we look at what happens when we multiply two matrices together. So assume you have some matrix A and another matrix B. When you multiply them together like this, let's say you get the identity matrix. What that tells you is that this combined function, a times b, multiplied by any vector on the right, would be the same thing as multiplying that vector by the identity matrix, which we just said is like doing nothing at all to that vector. So in other words, whatever b is doing to that vector, if we then apply a to that result, we get back to exactly where we started from. In other words, a and b are opposites. a is the opposite of b or b is the opposite of a, because it's doing an inverse transformation. Whatever you did in one case, you're simply reversing, and we're able to capture all that information in this simple formula, A times B is equal to the identity matrix. So it actually does come in very, very handy, not just in itself, but when we look at things like matrix multiplications and are talking about certain matrix operations being opposites or inverses of the others. So these are five very, very common matrices that I encounter all the time as a data scientist. And again, these all share the property that they are square, and so it made sense to talk about them all in one video. But again, there are very important matrices that are non-square, and also other square matrices that may be less important, but we'll still talk about them. But to close this video out, let's go ahead and look at the relationships between these five matrices that we just looked at. So we looked at square, symmetric, triangular, diagonal, and identity matrix. So we're gonna draw arrows in this diagram to say that a certain type of matrix implies that it's also a different kind of matrix. So let's look at symmetric matrices here. We said that symmetric implies square because symmetric had this property that the ijth and jith elements are the same. Well, that only makes sense if the matrix is square to begin with. Otherwise you can get into cases where the ijth element exists, but it doesn't make sense to talk about the jith element because it's not a square matrix. So symmetric implies square. Triangular also implies square because you need some kind of main diagonal and you need those elements above the diagonal to have the same number of elements below the diagonal for a proper triangular matrix. And so triangular also implies square. And before going down to these two, let's think about does symmetric imply triangular or vice versa? And we can answer that by coming up with some kind of counter examples possibly. Well, a triangular matrix, just imagine a triangular matrix that has ones on the diagonal and above the diagonal, but zeros below the diagonal that's clearly not a symmetric matrix. So there's no arrow going from triangular to symmetric. Does symmetric imply triangular? Well, no, because imagine a matrix that's completely full of ones, that's definitely symmetric, but it's not triangular because neither the upper nor lower triangle are exclusively zero. So there's no relationship between symmetric and triangular. What about diagonal matrices? So these are matrices whose diagonal is allowed to be non-zero, but everything off the diagonal needs to be equal to zero. 
that is by definition symmetric. Because if you flip that against its diagonal, then it's gonna look the exact same. It's gonna have zeros off of the diagonal, just like before, and the diagonal is gonna be unchanged. So diagonal does imply symmetric. What about diagonal and triangular? Well, diagonal also implies triangular because again, triangular matrices have zeros either above the diagonal or below the diagonal. And diagonal matrices actually satisfy both of those conditions. So it doesn't even matter if we're talking about an upper triangular matrix or a lower triangular matrix. In both cases, if it's diagonal, then it is triangular. And so we also showed that diagonal implies square because you can follow either of these causal arrows up here. Now the identity matrix, as we said, is just a more restrictive case of the diagonal matrix. We just enforce that it has only ones on the diagonal. And so we can also show through this chain of causality that identity implies diagonal, which implies symmetric or triangular, take your pick. Both of those eventually imply square. So hopefully this little diagram helps to understand all the types. They're not unique or distinct. Certain types do imply other types. Certain types are more restrictive forms of previous definitions we looked at. The main thing I wanted you to take away in this video though is not these definitions themselves or even this causal diagram here. The main thing that I care that you take away from this are all of these intuition blurbs we looked at. So what does it actually mean when I look and someone tells me a matrix is square or symmetric or triangular or diagonal or identity? Where should my mind go? Because that's gonna make you a better problem solver. Because that's gonna say that, oh, I see. I'm going to interpret this matrix in this way and assume that the matrix is talking about the same entities on the row and columns, for example. And that's just gonna make you better at understanding relationships between your data, the entities you care about, the features, all these different things. If you did enjoy this video, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I will see you all next time.